Okay, so we're there in Genesis chapter number 26, and um, there's lots we can learn from this fascinating chapter. I'm hoping to be able to get through it all right. Hope some of my voice is going to hold up. We'll just see how we see how we manage. We'll just jump straight into into um, into verse number one. Genesis chapter 26, verse one. It says, and there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gera. So <coughs> we see there that there's actually there's a famine in the land, just like it was in the days of his father. Because, of course, remember what happened to Abraham. He travelled around a lot, and, and it was because of um, various famines that happened. Mm. But also, I suppose one of the things that that tells us is that there's always going to be bad things happen. There's always going to be hard times. There was in the times of Abraham. There was in the times of, of, of Isaac. Um, in fact, it actually talks about in, in, in Matthew chapter 7. There's a very famous um, parable that Jesus talked about. He said in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them... I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And obviously we often talk about that because it's depending on if you build your house on the rock, if you build it on Jesus Christ, if you build it on his teachings, versus if you build it on the shifting sands, which change all the time, what's going to happen? One house stays firm and one house falls. But sometimes we overlook that it also says, no matter whether you built your house on the rock or whether you built it on the sand, the floods came, didn't they? You know, the, 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 the floods, you know, the, the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew. In other words, there's some, a storm came for both the houses. And that's kind of what we can see here with Isaac, that no matter what happens, you'll still have bad times. You'll still have hard things um, that, that'll go on. But also we see here that, um, <coughs> um, yeah, we also see that, that Isaac is kind of following in the footsteps of Abraham. Remember there was hard times and, and Abraham ended up going down and meeting Abimelech. Um, and then Isaac, the same thing. He's going down and meeting Abimelech. And so we can see from that that children often follow in the footsteps of their parents. And so that's why it's an important thing for parents. We need to be careful what we do, knowing that our children will follow us. You might say, well, I've made bad decisions and I've led my children down the wrong way. Well, it's never too late. It's never too late to say stop and to turn and go on the right way. And it might not happen straight away. It might take years. But eventually, children will see what their parents are doing. And we want to be leading them in the right way and not in the wrong way. Okay? And so that's just an encouragement here. We, we, we can see that there is that... Um, children had that tendency to follow their parents. Now have a look in verse number 2. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him, this is Isaac, and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, <coughs> and unto thy seed, will I give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So notice again, we have God here appears to Isaac, just like he did to Abraham. And what does he do? He promises to bless him and to multiply him greatly. Just the same promise that he gave to Abraham, it's like handed on down to Isaac. God appears and, and confirms that promise, if you like. Now look in verse number 5. It also says, um, And him shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because... That's an important word, okay? Because often people sort of talk about the, the blessing of Abraham being this unconditional thing. Mm. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. He says, And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we see that the blessing of Abraham was actually as a result of Abraham's obedience. It wasn't just some random thing, you know. And often we can even see this, even when through in the Bible, and we st I think we looked at it um, a, a bit last week, when it was, um, when we see, remember how God chose Jacob over Esau? Mm. Remember that, before they were even born? But even when we see God choosing people before they're born to do certain tasks, as, as he said, we need to remember that God knows the end from the beginning. So God knew what sort of man Jacob would be. He knew what sort of man Esau would be. You know, and, and in fact, it didn't talk about that in Hebrews. In fact, it slipped my mind the exact words, but if, if you look in Hebrews chapter number, um, excuse me, chapter number 12, it must be. Hebrews chapter number 12 describes Esau. Hebrews chapter 12, excuse me. <coughs> um, 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. If you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So Esau was described as what? As a fornicator, as a profane person. So, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that God chose Jacob as opposed to Esau, that that would be the line that Jesus would come through. I don't think that was the. I don't think it was a coincidence. And he, but Esau was the person who was a profane fornicator. I think God knew where Esau was going to go. Now that doesn't mean that God chose it for him. You know, Esau still had the choice. Okay, but it's important that we we understand that that there was a a um there's a blessing that's associated with disobedience or a curse associated with disobedience. Look back there in Genesis chapter number twenty six. Genesis chapter twenty six, and verse number verse number six. It said, um, and Isaac dwelt in Gera. Okay, so remember what God had said before? He said, sojourn in this land. He says, um, you know, I want you to sojourn in this land. This is the land of Gera. So Isaac did what God told him to do. Mm-hmm. Then in verse number seven, it says, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. So this kind of sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like we sort of, it's like we see Isaac as basically um, repeating the sins of, of his father. I mean, his father went, and remember, he, Abraham said to Sarah, you pretend that you're my sister. And in fact, didn't he do it to Abimelech? I think he did. It was the same person he did it to. Abimelech probably, he might have had his suspicions. I mean, we, we read later on, Abimelech, it maybe it's like, hang on, this is, this is Abraham's son, and he's arriving here with this lady, and he's saying it's his sister. It's like, this, this might be ringing bells in the back of Abimelech's mind. I think it probably is, okay? Have a look and see what happens in verse number 8. It says, And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Now, may, maybe it was him, or maybe it was someone else that was keeping an eye on him, but I, I think Abimelech may have had suspicions. Verse number 9, And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold of a surety, um, she is thy wife. And how said thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. Okay, so he gets found out. And his, his lying has been found out. And, and really, <coughs> lying to get out of the responsibility of protecting your wife, is that a good idea? No, it's not a good idea. It wasn't a good idea when his dad did it, and it wasn't a good idea when he did it either. I mean, the fact is, he says, Lest I die for her. Well, it's like, well, if you think about it, um, actually, have a, look in, have a look in Ephesians chapter number 5. If you look at Ephesians chapter number 5, you think, you know, he's saying, lest I should die for my wife. Well, that sort of brings um, Ephesians 5 to my mind. Mm-hmm. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number, I think it's 25. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So when it says gave himself for it, what's that talking about? That's talking about how Christ, he gave himself for the church. He died. He died. He gave himself for it. He loved, and therefore he gave. It says in uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But what did he do? He gave his son to die. Um, and so that's an important thing we need to understand. It's Husbands should love their wives and be prepared to die for them. John chapter 15, verse 13. John chapter 15, and verse number 13. John chapter 15, and verse number 13 says, greater love hath no man than this, mm. that a man lay down his life for his friends. Mm. So what's the greatest love someone can have to lay down their life? And well, that's, isn't that the sort of love that a husband should have for his wife? Absolutely. He should. He should have the sort of love that he's prepared to do that. Have a look at 1 John chapter number 3. Mm. 1 John <coughs> chapter number 3 and verse number 16. First John 3.16 is a very famous verse. 1 John 3.16, a great verse as well. 1 John, 3, 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Just notice in passing there, that's proof that Jesus is God. Isn't it? Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. God laid down his life for us. And it doesn't stop there, though. It says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So God, you know, um, he showed his love by laying down his life. 
Well, guess what? We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We should be prepared to die for one another, for brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're prepared to die for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, shouldn't we be prepared to die for our spouse? Absolutely, we should. You know. And I mean, to be honest, for most of us, hopefully, we're never going to be required to lay down our life in terms of dying. Okay? But, as in actually physically dying... But how about this? How about laying down our lives for our brethren, laying down our lives for our spouse, actually be preparing to, to serve our spouse, to, to, you know, think, put their needs before our needs. That's, that's a way of laying down your life, like laying down what you want to do and thinking, well, like, what's best for them, you know? And, and we're all familiar with that. So, I mean, you think of like a, a mother who would sacrifice for her children. She would go without so that her children could, could have the right clothes or have the right food that they need. Well, we're familiar with that sort of stuff. And that's, that's the way it should be in the life of a believer. That's the sort of love that we should have um, for, <coughs> excuse me, one another. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 10. Genesis 26 and verse number 10. <coughs> and Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lion with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. So notice what Abimelech says. He says, look, what have you done by lying to us? One of the people might have taken your wife, they might have slept with her, and, and brought guiltiness upon us. We would have been guilty because of this deceit that you've done. And the interesting thing is, we can see from this, because Abimelech's the king of the Philistines. This is some ungodly nation. We can see from this that even ungodly people still have some standards. You know, here, he's sort of implying that, you know, um, they knew it was wrong. Abimelech knew it was wrong to sleep with someone's wife. He said, if we knew it was your wife, then no one would have gone near her. But because you've said she's your sister, someone might have. Okay, so they, ungodly people, they still have standards. Okay, he knew it was wrong to sleep with someone else's wife. But it's actually also wrong to sleep with someone who you're not married to, whether they're someone's wife or not. Okay, and so the interesting things we, we might want to ask... Well, what is the basis for our standards? Ungodly people have got standards. We, we have standards, and our standards should line up with what the Bible says. Mm. And, and that's the thing. People, you wonder, what is the basis for our standards? I was watching an interesting thing, um, this big debate going on over in Australia, and they're talking about the marriage equality. It's in all the news, and there's a, big, there's a vote and stuff like that that's coming on. And they talk about, they call it marriage equality over in Australia. And, and you hear that this sort of catchphrase. They say, look... Um, and they say, look, well, you can marry whoever you want to, talking to a heterosexual person, and then the homosexual person is saying, well, why can't I marry whoever I want to? But you see, with so many of these things that they say, what they say, they're saying things that are false. You see, if, if, if someone says to me, being a heterosexual, I can marry whoever I want, mm. can I marry whoever I want? Well, the answer is no, I can't. Why? Because I'm married. Mm. Did you know it's, it's against the law for me to get married? Why? Because I'm married. Because the law says, in New Zealand and in Australia as well, you can't be married to more than one person at once. So it's against the law for me to marry anyone because I'm currently married. Okay? And so there are and so it's to say you can marry whoever you want is, is it's it's a crazy thing. And 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 yet they, they they sort of put it out as being we want marriage equality, we all want equal rights. Well guess what? We do have the right. I have the right before I got married, as a single person to marry any other person of the opposite gender. And mm. everyone else has that same thing. But as soon as someone gets married, mm. then guess what? They no longer have the, 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 the right to get married because they currently are married. And you can't get married while you're currently married. Well, of course, some people would like that, though. Mm. And what about Muslims? Muslims believe in polygamy, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, They believe in you can have four wives four wives at a time and they can actually have more than that because they have these you can get married for a short period there's all sorts of when you look into it there's the stuff they do it's, it's it's quite wicked but just in general they say you're allowed to have up to four wives that's not accepted in this country it's not accepted in australia but what's i mean why can't they marry who they want marriage equality but then again what why stop with that why stop with polygamy i mean what about what about children there are people who would like to marry children did you know that What's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Who are you to say that this is right and this is wrong? Why can't you can marry who you want? Why can't I marry what I want? Okay. What about people? What about bestiality? 
You know, and you find these things listed beside each other in the Bible. It's quite interesting. If you look in Leviticus, you'll find homosexuality comes right beside you. Know, someone lying down with a beast and stuff like that. Why can't I? Why can't I marry an animal? Why not? What's wrong with it? You can marry who you want to. Why can't I marry who I want to? Do you see the silliness that people say? And they're saying it's all in the name of equality. Or well, what about this? And I've even heard, what about people marrying inanimate objects? People do, they want to do, I think I even read somewhere, someone wants to marry themselves. Okay, but there's people, I want to marry my cell phone, I want to marry my car, I want to marry, it's just craziness. And what it is, they say it's all about marriage equality, but it's not. What they're not really after is marriage equality, because every person has the same rights. Everyone's got the rights to, you can marry one person of the opposite gender, and that's it. That's the rights. Everyone's got that equal, equal right. But what they want to do, they want to change marriage mm. to mean something else. Mm. You see, me and my relationship with, 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 uh, my, with my cell phone or, 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 with, or with an animal, you know, with my cat or with a, with a whatever, I mean, that's not marriage. And, and you can't just say that it's marriage by what you're doing. If you're going to say that's marriage, you're changing the meaning of marriage. Okay? And... Um, mm. And that's an important thing we understand, is that that's what, that's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to bring about marriage equality. They're trying to change the definition of marriage. They're trying to change it. And always when people say these things, look at the questions, that what they're saying, and also look at what they're not saying. But sorry, I better stop there, because we better, you know, the point is, we see that even ungodly people, they still have standards. These people that are in favour of, of homosexual marriage, well, are they in favour of, are they fine with bestiality? Are they fine with polygamy? And most of them would say, no, we're not. Now, a lot of them wouldn't. A lot of the people that are into homo marriage, hey, polygamy, that's great. They're right into that as well. But a lot of them would say, no, well, no, 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 polygamy's wrong, or certainly bestiality's wrong, or paedophilia, you know, that's definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. What's the basis for it, though? Mm -hmm. See, the, if, if you believe the Bible, you've got a great basis for it. But if you don't, well, it's just your opinion. You might like that, but someone else likes something else. And that's their opinion. Who are you to say that they're wrong? Okay? So but let's, let's get back to Genesis um, 26. Um, Genesis 26, verse number 11. <coughs> and, and Abimelech charged all his people, so he commanded all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So here we see Isaac is actually protected. Now he's protected by Abimelech, but in actual fact it's kind of God who's protecting him. I mean, I, I think probably what it was... Um, the reason why Abimelech said this is probably because, if you remember, in fact, actually have a look back there, at, um, look at Genesis chapter 20. Um, Abimelech got reproved by God during Abraham's time, and I suspect he still remembers. I suspect, um, have a look back in Genesis chapter 20 and verse number 2. Genesis chapter 20, verse number 2. It said, And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Who would like God to come to you in the night and say, You're dead. He says, Look, behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister. And she, even she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, <coughs> excuse me, have I said, have I done this? And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. So God was the one who actually protected Abraham and Sarah. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So it's a pretty big threat. God's saying, look, if you don't give Sarah back, you're going to die, and you know all that's yours is going to die. So I think Abimelech probably got a bit scared by that, and so are we surprised years later when the same thing happens with Isaac, and then all of a sudden what do we find out? Abimelech's saying, hey, don't touch this man. If you touch this man or his wife, you're going to be put to death. Because he's probably thinking... I don't want to. I, don't, I know what God's threatened before. I don't want that happening to me. Okay, look down at verse number twelve. Verse number twelve. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. So God, He continues to bless Isaac. Okay, we see that as Abraham was blessed, Isaac is also blessed. You know, and we understand it's not 
and we, we talked about this the other week, but it's, it's, a, it's good to, to emphasize these points again and again, is that it's not a sin to be rich. Okay, Abraham was rich, that wasn't a sin. Isaac was rich, that wasn't a sin. But it is a, a sin to desire to be rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, have a look in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 9. 1 Ch Timothy chapter <coughs> number 6 and verse number 9 says, But they that will be rich. They that will be rich means they that want to be rich. If you want to be rich, it says, mm -hmm. They that will be rich fall. Now, it doesn't say they that will be rich might fall. Mm. It says they that will be rich, they do fall. If you desire to be rich, you're going to fall. Where are you going to fall? Into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Mm. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So the desire to be rich is something to be fled from. Mm. Run away from it. Flee from it. It's a dangerous thing. We saw that before, okay? Um, turn back to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis 26, verse number, <coughs> verse number 13. So we saw, um, excuse me, verse number 12. So, oh yes, so we saw in verse 12, Isaac sowed in that land. He received the same year and hundredfold the Lord blessed him. Now, look at verse number 13. And the man, this is talking about Isaac, <coughs> waxed great, or grew great. That's the word wax means. The, uh, the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. So, we can see from this, when someone does really well, God's blessing Isaac, his, his, you know, his flocks and everything's all multiplying. And what happens? People envy him. You know, when someone does well, it can often make them a target of envy. You might have heard the, um, what's it called, the tall poppy syndrome. When someone's done, done well, it's like, it's like the thing of a poppy, a tall one sticks up. And the one that sticks up, people want to knock it down. When someone does really well, they can tend to be that. Where when, so, you, know, um, you know, it could be a sporting figure, it could be someone that's doing better than the average. And it's like people want to knock them down and bring them to their, down to their level. And, and one of the reasons for that can be, sometimes people can have an attitude where we blame our own failures on the success of others. So when we say, see someone else being successful, and we think, well, the fact that they're successful, that's why I'm not successful. And blaming our, our failures on their successes, you know. And now, it is true that sometimes people can succeed because of dishonesty. Sometimes people can fail and it's because of unfairness. That's true. That can happen. But I mean, to be honest, more often than not, people succeed or fail based on their own actions. Mm. Yep. You know, it's, it, it's, it's the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says it, you know, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You reap what you sow. And that's just a fact. And I mean, just with regards to money and stuff like that, the fact is that the average person who makes lots of money, you know, they might be a bit dishonest. They might be crooked in certain areas. Many of them are. Mm. But they're pretty hard working, mm. aren't they? You know, you could look at someone like, I don't know, like someone like John Key or whatever. I mean, John Key, he, was the, he was, the, was the Prime Minister of New Zealand, very wealthy man. A lot of people would accuse him of all sorts of dishonesty. And I suspect so if you see the people that he's worked for and stuff like that. But he, is anyone really going to say that he didn't work hard? Mm. I mean, he came from a single parent. He, came, he had a solo mum, came out of poverty. He worked, there's no doubt that he worked hard. Now, I'm not holding up as a great role model or anything like that, but the fact is that people who succeed, they actually, there's work involved. You know, there's, there is work involved. And so um, when other people succeed, we should actually be happy when other people succeed, and we should, we should be sad when other people don't succeed. The, the Bible says in, in Romans 12, 15, it says, Rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. You know, we should, we should be happy for people, and we should be sad for people, you know, have empathy for them, you know. And I mean, this, this is in a personal level, but also, I mean, we should even, I was thinking, we should even have this sort of, the same thing for churches. You know, sometimes, sometimes there can be churches that can think that they're in some sort of competition. It's like they think, I'm in a competition with other churches. Well, really, the only competition we're in is the competition to do what God wants us to do. Now, 
if you're in a, with, if there's a church in another city or in the same city as you, if it's a church where they believe the gospel, it's a church where they're preaching the gospel. Would I that they would I rather would I prefer that there are more churches in Dunedin that preach the gospel, that went out soul winning, that used the King James? Would I prefer that? Absolutely, I would. The more of them, the better, because I've got limited time, I've got limited energy. I would think it was great if there was another church over in South Dunedin, if there's one up in up in North East Valley, if there's one there where the, the Bible's being faithfully preached and people are going out knocking doors. I would love it if I go and knock on someone's door to go to preach them the gospel, and they go, oh, look, I'm already saved. Yes, yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know that? Oh, someone came from this church up the street. Mm. I think, fantastic. That's a good thing. That's what we should desire. We should want that. You know, we should want other churches to succeed. That's my prayer for other churches around New Zealand. Now, there are, there are some good churches around New Zealand, but a lot of the churches are pretty watered down. They don't preach the, preach the, Bi- mm. preach the whole Bible. They, they don't, a lot of them don't go out and do any soul winning, don't preach the God. I pray that those churches which aren't doing what they should do would change and start doing what they should do. That they would begin to preach the gospel. They would preach all the bits of the Bible that people don't want to hear, but which God still said, and we need to hear about. Okay, That's what we should desire. Okay, We should have that right attitude. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 26. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 15. <clears throat> it says in verse 15, For all <clears throat> the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So the Philistines here, we see, what have they done? Because of their envy, what have they done? They had filled in all the wells that had been dug in the time of Abraham. Now, wells are a very important thing. You think about this, you're living out in the wilderness. How important is it to have a well, a place to drink? Yeah, without it, you're probably going to die. It's a very valuable, very important thing to do, you know? And so if you go and fill someone's well in, what are you trying to do? You're trying to drive them away, aren't you? You're trying to drive them away because if, there's, if they've got nowhere to drink, they're going to have to go somewhere where there is water. And so that's why, they, that's why they put earth into these wells. They filled them up. Look at verse number 16. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art <coughs> much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerah and dwelt there. So Abimelech wants Isaac to leave. You know, maybe maybe he feels threatened by him. He's being very successful. He's you know his, his his herds and his flocks, everything's multiplying, and um, so yeah, he wants him to leave. So what does Isaac do? He departed. He did. He left, but he didn't go too far. He still um you know he still stayed where God wanted him because God wanted him in this place in this place Gera. So he didn't go that far, but he did. You know he he wasn't he wasn't looking for a fight. You know he wasn't trying to fight with Abimelech. Um, and that's a good sign, you know. The Bible talks about the fact that we shouldn't be people who are looking for a fight. We shouldn't be desiring for a, a fight. It says in Proverbs fifteen one, it says, "A soft answer turneth away wrath, mm-hmm. but grievous words <coughs> stir up anger." So we shouldn't just be on a on a hair trigger just to fight with people. Isaac wasn't. He was trying to keep the peace. Abimelech said he wanted him to depart, so he did. He moved away. Okay. Second um, Timothy chapter number two. Have a look at Second Timothy chapter number two. And verse number 24, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and verse number 24, it says, 2 Timothy 2, 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him, at his will. So what do we see here? The servant of the Lord must not strive. The servant of the Lord is not supposed to be striving and fighting. Mm. Now it's not that it's a case that we should never fight, because in the same in the same book, have a look at verse number 7 of chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 7, Paul says, this is the same person writing, says, I've fought a good fight. <coughs> I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Okay, So it doesn't mean that we never fight. But we shouldn't be aiming to fight. That's not our objective. We're not going around looking for a fight. Who can I fight? That's not the Christian attitude at all. That's not the attitude that Isaac had. But having said that, turn back to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. And we'll see about Isaac here. Have a look at verse number 18. Genesis 26 verse 18. It says, And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. So Isaac, 
Allah wasn't trying to fight. He wasn't a pushover either. You know, he saw <coughs> what the Philistines had done, and he stood firm. You know, and you think about it. Obviously, there's the there's the physical application. This is what actually happened. These were real wells that had been dug by Abraham. The Philistines had stopped them, and Isaac redug them. That that really happened. But of course, the Bible says that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. There are things that we can learn from these. And so you think, well, what is it that you find in a well? What do you find in a well? Water. Yeah, you find water in a well. Well, in the Bible, water pictures a number of things. For example, it pictures um, the Holy Spirit. It pictures the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, John chapter 7 and verse number 38. John 7 and verse number 38. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So one thing that water pictures in the Bible is the Holy Spirit. But the Bible also pictures water in um, Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 26. Um, we saw before, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So their water is likened to the word of God. Okay, in the same way that you can wash and water to be clean, well, God's word can wash you to be clean. Okay, so it's likened to the word of God. Well, <coughs> here we have, back in Genesis um, 26, we have believers like Abraham, you know, and Ab digging a well. And then we have the world, you know, the Philistines, they're stopping them up. So what does Isaac have to do when that happens? The, you know, the believers dig the well, the, the, the world comes in and stops them up. So what do the believers have to do? They have to dig them again. And that's what we see Isaac doing. Isaac has to dig them again. And so we can see there is, a, there is a constant struggle that we need to engage in. You know, the world will try to constantly conform us to its standards. But we need to be conformed to the word of God. It says in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we need to be transformed by the, by the renewing of our mind. How do we renew our mind? We renew, renew our mind by reading God's word. And that's washing it. That's going to change. As we read God's word, we're going to be reading things like, Well, my thoughts are thinking this, but God's saying this. And so, and, and over time, it changes us. That's how, how we renew our mind. We change what we think by spending time in God's word. Mm. But not only that, <coughs> it says in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You see, the Bible says there is an old path. There's an old way, and it's a good way. So remember, Abraham digged these wells. But what did the Philistines did? They blocked them up. Mm. Okay, they, they didn't want the way that Abraham had dug. Mm. They wanted to cover that up. It says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28, it says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And so one of the things these wells can picture, that's something they were there from, from previous generations. They, they were something that Abraham had wanted to pass on down to his son, but the Philistines had blocked them. He'd stopped them. And so those wells, they were like ancient landmarks. And the Bible warns about, it says, remove not the ancient landmark. And we, we need to realise that often there's a reason why things are the way they are. There's a reason. You know, traditions aren't always a bad thing. We were talking before about the whole, the whole gay marriage thing. You know, there are reasons why marriage is defined as one man and one woman. And what people are trying to do today, they're trying to move the landmark. They're trying to change it. So no, marriage is not. Marriage means something else. Okay, they're trying to change it. Okay, but we need to realise traditions, <coughs> traditions are not always a bad thing. Now there are times when traditions can be bad. Mm -hmm. Traditions can be a bad thing. Have a look at Mark chapter seven. Mark chapter number seven. <coughs> Mark chapter number seven and verse number one. Mark chapter seven and verse number one. <coughs> Mark chapter seven verse one. It says, "Then came together unto him the Pharisees." And certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they washed their hands, eat sorry, except they washed their hands oft, 
eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto him, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own traditions. He's saying, look, you guys reject God's commandment to keep your tradition. So this is a bad tradition, what's going on here. Verse 10, it says, For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Verse 13, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So Jesus is warning about people who reject what God's word says and instead they want to do something else because, well, tradition says this is what we do. Mm -hmm. So just because something's traditional, just because something's old, doesn't mean that it's necessarily right because it might be in conflict with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, But often, mm -hmm. traditions are not in conflict with the Bible. Often they agree with the Bible. Um, have a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 15 says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So it's an important thing that traditions can be good. He says, hold on to the traditions which you've been taught, whether we taught them to you in person or whether it was just from this letter, this epistle that we gave you. Okay, so... Here we're looking back and say, well, what are what are some of these wells? What are these wells that Abraham dug, the Philistines filled them in, and then Isaac had to re-dig again? What would be some wells that could be in our time? What would be some wells that could be changed? Um, probably, I suppose, the most important well that people try and change is regards to salvation. It says in Isaiah chapter 12 and verse number 3, it says, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. You see, today, many people say that in order to be saved, you have to live a good life. Isn't that what people say? Mm -hmm. You know, even though Romans 3.12 says there is none that doeth good, no, not one. So they say, oh, you've got to be good. <coughs> but the Bible says there's none good. Mm. So how does, how does that work out? You know, they say you have to turn from your sins to be saved. Even though that it says in Jonah chapter 3, turning from your wicked ways, according to Jonah 3, is work. Okay? Well, Guess what? Turning from your wicked ways, that is work. It sure is work. Well, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, John um, 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Um, Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. I love this. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 28. It says, therefore, we conclude, conc you know what a conclusion is? It's like this, this sums it up. You want to sum it all up? He says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, that's belief, without the deeds of the law. So do you have to do the deeds of the law to be saved? No. Justified by faith without the deeds of the law. We won't go into it now. We've gone into it many times. Romans chapter 4, look at the start. And it, and it talks about how you can believe without doing works. Now, should we do good works? Absolutely, we should. But we're not saved by works, okay? And so that's an important thing you know, to understand. That's a, that's a well that people are trying to stop up. They're trying to throw dirt in it and say, no, we're going to change it. We're going to change it. No, the Bible says it's salvation by faith. That's why we sing the old hymns. You know, you sing, if we sing the old hymns because years ago, the people who wrote, you know, lots of these hymns we read, you know, Fanny Crosby and all these different people, it was salvation by faith. And that's why we keep singing them. You know, some of these new songs that people want to change to and sing the new songs, they don't say the same things anymore. You know, a lot of these modern choruses, they just have the same verse going over and over again. And it's saying something that it's it's, it doesn't have any real doctrine in there. You know, a song like, Our God is an awesome God. 
the, the song called that, Our God is an awesome God. And it just goes over and over saying the same thing over and over again. Mm. But I mean, couldn't a Muslim sing that? They'd sing, well yeah, our God's an awesome God. Because there's no doctrine in it. There's no, you know, put your faith on Jesus Christ. Mm. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that should be saved. Whereas that's what, great songs in here, verily, verily, you know, great song. So that's an important thing. We need to, we need to stick to the traditions with regards to salvation. What about this? This is another well that people are trying to stop up. God's word. Okay, the well that God's word is, is pure, that it's been preserved. You know, that has had a lot of people who've thrown earth into that. You know, and, and this is nothing new. Like, people have always done it. If you, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 17, even in the time of Paul, it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak with Christ. In Paul's day, people were corrupting God's word. Well, guess what? In our day today, people are still corrupting it. Right back at the start, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Satan, what did he say? Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that or maybe he said something else? You go to a Christian bookshop and you look at all the Bibles on the shelf and you think, I wonder what God said. Did he say this? Or did he say this? Or did he say this? Or did he say this? All these different things, you know? Most churches today, they say that, yeah, God's word was perfect in the originals, but we don't have the originals. Well, that doesn't really line up with what Jesus said. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He said, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Um, Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How can you live by every word if you don't have every word? Because these new Bibles, they don't claim to have, they don't claim that they're perfect. They don't claim they've got all of God's words. They're just, just rough enough. It's just an approximation. But does that match with what the Bible says? Psalm 12 verse number 6 says, Every word of God is no, it doesn't. It says the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said, I'll preserve my word forever. Well, was it true or not? Did he preserve his word, or is it lost? Because mm. those old manuscripts were lost. I was going to do it, um, oh, no, we won't do it for the sake of time, but <coughs> have a look in Jeremiah. Um, we won't go through it, but in Jeremiah, I was just listening to it on the uh, when I was driving home in the car. Um, in Jeremiah chapter number, oh, must be 36, I think it is. Yeah, Jeremiah 36. We won't look at it now, but in your own time, read Jeremiah 36. And you'll see an example of what happens with God's word. Okay, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, it was actually written by someone, I think it was called Barak. Barak the scribe wrote it down. Okay, and so what happened was Jeremiah spoke, Barak wrote it down, wrote it down on a scroll, and then, but then they gave it to the king at that time. They gave it to the king. And um, the king didn't like what it said. And so he took God's word and he cut it. Cut it with a knife. And he started putting it into, putting it into the fire. And he started burning it up. So guess what? Do you know what happened to the original book of Jeremiah? It was destroyed. But then what happened? What happened? He just wrote it out again. He made a copy. He made a copy, and then he added many more word like words as well. Okay, So <laughs> that's the first example. We don't have to have the original, because that original was burnt. It was put on the fire, even within the before the book of Jeremiah was even finished. It was already been destroyed. So we don't need to seek after these originals, because God promised to preserve his word. He preserved it in the book of Jeremiah, and, you know, and so we see over and over this promise. Have a look at um, uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1. First, <coughs> excuse me. First Peter chapter number one and verse number twenty-four. First Peter chapter one and verse twenty-four says, "All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth. What happens to grass? It just withers up, doesn't it? It withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth for a while, forever." And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of the Lord endures forever. And also, just in case we don't forget, this is the word um, which by the gospel is preached unto you. We need to be using God's word. It's being preserved. Let's go and preach the gospel. 
Let's go and preach it to people. Take it to people and show them God's word so they can believe and they can be saved. Okay, That's a well that's been stopped up. Well, what's another well that's been stopped up in these days or people are trying to stop up? What about this? What about the, like, the concept of honouring other people? Honouring other people. We live in a world today that is very, it's very rude and it's very disrespectful. Whereas in contrast, God's word says that we should give honour to others. <coughs> We should give honour to others. Have a look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And verse number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And verse number 1. It says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So it's saying, look, if you're an employee, if you've got an employer, then you should count the, the person who's paying your wages, count them worthy of all honour. Why? That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You see, if you're a bad employee, if you're rude, if you're talking back to your boss, if you're not doing what you should be doing, mm. that's going to cause the name of God to be blasphemed. Okay, because, oh, well, oh yeah, I've got a Christian who works for me, and he's bone idle, he's rude, he never does anything, he's always back chatting. That's not what it should be. We should give honour. The Bible says. Um, have a look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 and verse number um, 17. 1 Timothy chapter number 5 verse 17 says, Let the elders, and this is talking about within the church context, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. Now, just to, just to be sure, um, sometimes, so this is talking about that the pastor in a church should have honour. Now, I could... As many pastors do, many pastors like to really emphasise this. I'm not really big on this in the sense that I think it's I think there's a big danger. Now it's important in the same way that you should honour your boss. You should you know parents, and we'll look at it in a minute. Parents, uh, children should honour their parents and all that sort of stuff. There can be a danger in honouring pastors too much. Okay, it's an important thing. It's we should be not rude to them. We should not we should not be disrespectful to them. But we need to be careful and not say well the pastor says it so it must be right. You know, I don't. If you have doubts about anything that I say, if you have, I want you to come and talk to me about it. Mm. Okay, and I'm not going to bite your head off. I want you to, I want you to challenge me on what I believe. And if I can't, if you say, well, what about this? And if I just say, well, I think this, and I can't show you any scripture, mm. ignore what I say, because it's just me blowing smoke. Okay, it's an important thing. And if I show in the Bible, it's like I see what you're saying. Okay, the Bible says that. Okay, I understand. Change your belief. That's fine. But there can be this overemphasis where just because the pastor says we blindly follow it, and that's that's not a good thing. That's not that's something we should do. But having said that, pastors are worthy of honour. What about this? Um, First Peter chapter number three. First Peter chapter number three, and verse number seven. First Peter chapter number three and verse number seven says, "Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about the wives, according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel." and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands should give <coughs> honour to their wives. Okay? That's an important thing. Husbands should honour their wives. That means thinking about them, thinking, how can I help them? How can I give respect to them? What can I do for them? That's an important thing that husbands should be doing. <coughs> we should be honouring, husbands should be honouring our wives. But not only that, First Peter chapter 2, verse 17, First Peter 2, 17, actually says, Honour all men. Love the brotherhood, Fear God, honour the king. So we should be giving honour and respect to all men, not just only particular sorts of men. It doesn't matter what, what sort of, um, uh, where someone comes from, what their background is, we should be giving honour to all men. But especially, we should be honouring um, one another. We should be honouring fellow believers. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10. It says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honour preferring one another. So that talks about the same thing in, in, I think it's Philippians 2, esteeming other better than themselves. Okay, that's what, we should, that's what we should be doing. We should be esteeming other people higher, treating them with honour, especially believers. Okay, um, what are some other, some other wells that have, that have been stopped up today? What about this? What about the idea of preaching against sin? That's something that's frowned upon. That's something that's that's. I mean, isn't it? I, I think it was it DCBC, what sort of the biggest Baptist church in town? Mm. Didn't they have a thing? And I, I never, I never saw it, but someone told me about it. They had a there was a thing in the paper about it where they decided they weren't going to preach about sin. 
They did, I think it might have been the Purpose Driven Church. They did mm-hmm. surveys and questionnaires, asked people what they wanted to hear. And people said, well, you know, we're not really into the sin business. So, so we're not going to talk about sin. Well, <coughs> that's, not, that's not what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 1 says, Spear not, cry aloud, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression mm-hmm. in the house of Jacob their sin. That's what's supposed to happen. You know, um, 2 Timothy chapter number 2 Actually, have, uh, have a look at Micah chapter number 3 first. Um, Micah chapter number 3. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Micah chapter number 3. And verse number 8. Micah chapter number 3 verse 8 says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Mm. When the Holy Spirit's upon someone, when it's upon a, a preacher, what's he going to do? He's going to declare people's sin. He's going to preach against the wrongs that the people are doing. Um, 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, we're very familiar with these verses. He, Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There'll be a time when people will have stopped that well. They'll say, no, we don't want that anymore. They will, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables. You see, there can be a real tendency to just tell people what they want to hear. And in most churches today, that's exactly what. You go to church and you'll hear what you want to hear. And so people will find a church that's going to just tell me what I want. They'll just pat me on the back and tell me, hey, you're doing great. But maybe we're not doing great. Maybe there are things that we can do better. Maybe there are things that we can improve. And in fact, there is things we can improve. Every one of us. There are things that we can improve. There are things that we can do better. And so we need to be hearing what God has to say. And not be, not be, not be man pleasers. The Bible says, if I yet please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. Okay? Um, what about this? Here's, a, here's another one. Um, a well that's been stopped up today. What about the, the concept of men's and women's roles? Men's and women's roles. That's something where today, oh, we're all equal. Mm. Everything's the same. Men and women are the same. Well, if you read the Bible, they're not the same. Mm. The Bible says, but if any pride provide not for his own, especially in his own house, it says he's, he's denied the faith and is worse mm. than an infidel. The Bible says a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Why is he worse than an unbeliever? Because, then this is talking about a believer, a Christian man who doesn't provide for his own family, he's bringing reproach on the name of Christ. Just the same way as a, an employee who's bad mouthing their employer and is slack and lazy, that's bringing reproach on the name of Christ. Well, so is a man who won't work. In fact, the Bible says if a man will not work, it says if any will not work, neither shall he eat. The Bible says if, if a man's not prepared to work, he shouldn't be getting paid. He shouldn't be getting money so he can go and buy food. No, you won't work, you don't eat. You say, well, that sounds pretty harsh. I didn't say it. <coughs> that's what God said. That's what God says, and that's, that's what once people used to believe. Mm-hmm. Okay, but, but these days, that's no longer the case. Okay, what about, um, <coughs> those are some of the men's roles, what about the women's roles? Um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 11, 1 Timothy 2 verse 11 says, Let the woman, and this is speaking out within the church, learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use super authority over the man, but to be in silence. Mm-hmm. Okay, so does that fly in today's world? Woman, be silent in the churches, for it's not permitted unto him to speak. It's just another chapter I'm going into there. Um, does that fly? Or will you find church after church after church that behind the pulpit is a woman? Many churches, that's the case. Okay? They're not silent in the church. They're, they're usurping authority over the man. I mean, in many cases where I've known where there was a husband and a wife team, the one who wore the pants was the woman. She was, she was the one who was, who was really in charge. She was the one who was really dominant. But that's not what the Bible says it should be. And people say, oh, well, that's, but that's just cultural. Really? Well, what does it say in the very next verse? It says, for Adam, because Adam was formed first, mm. then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Paul takes it right back to Adam and Eve. It's not just oh, in that time, in Timothy's time, a couple of thousand years ago. Go way back 6,000 years ago, back to Adam and Eve, and it's the same then, and it's the same now. Okay, God's word doesn't change. What else does it say about men and, men's and women's roles? What about um, Titus chapter number 2? Titus chapter number 2, 
Titus 2, verse number 3 says, The age of women likewise, that they be in behaviours becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Is that a popular teaching today? That's a well where people have shoved the whole pile of dirt into it. What do we need to do? We need to dig that well. In fact, I'm going to be over the next few weeks. We're going to be we're going to be in Titus too, not this Sunday, but the Sunday after. I think we're going to be digging that well. Okay, we're going to be digging digging that well, which people have stopped. We're going to be digging it out again. Okay, um, good grief. We're going to turn back to um, <coughs> excuse me, Genesis 26 or times flying. Genesis chapter number 26 and verse number 19. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 19. It says, And Isaac's servants digged in the valley, and found there a well of spring and water. And the herdmen of Gerah did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Mm-hmm. And they digged another well, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence, and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, mm-hmm. and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Isaac digs more wells. The first two they're called Esek and Sitna, uh, referring to, you know, obviously there's a bit of strife, hostility, fighting going on there. Um, and so that's why he named them because of that. The third one he calls Rehoboth because God has made room for them. Okay? So Isaac, he unstopped the wells which his father digged, but then notice also he dug his own wells. And I mean, this can picture digging into God's word for yourself. You see, It's great for us to see what's been handed down to us from previous generations. It's great to hold on to the traditions which have been received, which are good traditions from the Bible. But we need to also have that attitude that when we find something in the Bible, we need to be prepared to dig into the Bible ourselves, and when we find something in the Bible that contradicts what we previously believed, or what was handed down to us, we should, you know, should we stick with our tradition, or should we prepare to change? We should be prepared to change. That's right. Okay, and now don't be in a hurry to do it. Make sure of it. Read the whole Bible. Check and see. You know, don't just think, "Oh, I'm going to just chop and change and chop and change." Because if something's been passed down, often there's a good reason why it's been passed down. But at the same time, our loyalty has to be to God's word and not to traditions. Mm. Verse number twenty-three. <coughs> and he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, "I'm the God of Abraham, thy father." Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So God appears to Isaac again. He promises to bless him for Abraham's sake. And and Abraham's obedience, we see here, it resulted in blessings for his descendants. Because he's also saying here, I will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Because of what Abraham did, I'm going to be blessing you and your seed. Verse number 25. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. And pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. So Isaac called on the name of the Lord. Okay, um, just like Abraham did. Abraham, we saw him repeatedly calling on the name of the Lord. Isaac calls on the name of the Lord. Okay, over and over. And we know the Bible says, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Okay, and so salvation comes by calling on the name of the Lord in faith, obviously. But not only that, throughout our lives we should continue to call upon the name of the Lord. It says, For thou art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy, unto all them that call upon thee. We should be continually calling upon God. Okay. Um, <coughs> notice also what it says here. It says that he built an altar there. Verse number, verse number 25. And he builded an altar there. Well, we would associate an altar with what? With like maybe, think of the temple. You have an altar in a temple. The place where God dwells. Now this is prior to the time of the temple. But where does God dwell? That's what an altar is associated with. Well, we think in the New Testament, we think of the house of God. Okay, the house of God is the church. And what did he do in this particular place? He built an altar there, called on the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there. He pitched his tent there. That tells us, we, it talks about how we should be pitching our tent where? In God's house. We sang earlier on, Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Okay, that's something we should do. Have a look at Psalm number 92. Psalm number 92. Psalm number 92 and verse number 12. Psalm number 92. <coughs> excuse me. In verse number 12. Psalm 92 verse 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like a 
palm tree, he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Okay, so it's an important thing. We, we need to be pitched in God's house. We need to be planted. And when we are, we'll flourish. Okay? <coughs> so that's what happened there. We see um, uh, he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. You know? And I mean, once again, we the well likened to God, the, the, the water of God's word. It says in 1 Timothy 3.15, um, uh, these things right unto you, hoping to come with you shortly. But if I tarry long, and they know us how they ought us to behave themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so we see that God's house is the place where God's word, the truth of God's word, should come from. That's where there should be a well. It should be dug in God's word. And churches should be, should be planted upon God's truth. Um, look back in verse number 26. Verse number 26. Verse number 26, it says, um, Then Abimelech went to him from Gera, and, uh, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt, betwixt us and thee. And let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, and thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the morning, early in the morning, and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. So although there was, there was strife between Abimelech and Isaac, it didn't stop Isaac doing what was right, and being blessed by God. Okay, And so much so that what we see here, Abimelech actually acknowledged it, and he wanted to make peace with him. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a man's way please the Lord... He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, that's what we, Isaac was, his way pleased God. And even the people who were against him, they came and they wanted to be at peace with him. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, if it be possible. So understand, is it always possible to be at peace with people? No, sometimes not. You know, David said, I, when I speak, I'm for peace. So I'm for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Okay, mm. But it says in Romans 12, 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, in other words, do what you can, live peaceably with all men. Okay, But having said that, we need to do our best to live at peace, but sometimes there's not going to be anything we can do about it. People are going to fight. Um, Jesus said in John chapter, number, John chapter number 15, John 15 verse 18, John 15 verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world will love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Okay? And so there we see... <coughs> This persecution is going to come. It says in 2 Timothy, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution is going to come, but we can still try and live peaceably. Okay, We can still try and live peaceably. And here we see that they, that's what they did. They made an agreement in verse number 31. It says, and they, um, they swear one to another. That's what they're doing. They made an agreement to be at peace. They agreed to be at peace. Now look at verse number 32. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning a well which they had digged and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Okay, and um, so Isaac, he, he names the new well to commemorate the, the, commemorate the agreement that they had. That word bear means, means well. If you have a look at Numbers, we won't turn there now, but Numbers 21, 16, we can see that there's a place called Bear because there was a well there. Um, Sheba refers to the oath that they made. Okay, and so that's what he was naming the, we often see it in the Bible, he was naming it, this is like the well of, of the oath or whatever, that's why he called it Beersheba. Verse number 34, verse 34, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Berai the Hittite, and Bashamath the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So Esau took two wives. Now, I won't bother turning there, but um, <laughs> how many wives are you supposed to have? One. Okay, he took two wives. Jesus said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they two 
shall be one flesh. Okay? Um, important thing that we understand. You're only supposed to have one wife. But not only that, they were people of the land. They weren't godly women. You know, and there's many places where you can read where ungodly women turn people's hearts away. Um, even King Solomon, as great as King Solomon was, what did King Solomon do though? He took a lot of wives. He took lots and lots of wives. And it says in, in First Kings, it says, For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord as God, as was the heart of David his father. So, because he had these ungodly wives, they turned his heart away. Okay? And so that's, I suspect that's probably why they, these wives, they were a grief of mind to Isaac and to Rebekah. I think that, that's probably why they were a grief of mind to them. You know, who you choose for a husband or a wife is very important. It can make or break you, you know. I mean, why do you think that the qualifications of an elder, they actually, if we looked at it in First Timothy, it actually talks about the qualifications of a wife. It's even, even so must their wives be grave. Mm. Not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. It describes the conduct of the wives. Why would that be? Because if a man doesn't have a good wife, can he be a good elder? Can he be a good pastor? He can't. Mm. That's, that's just a fact. You know, I mean, if he can't lead his wife, how can he lead other people? That's why the whole ridiculous thing about, you know, you know, people being single, not being married at all, not having children. That's a crazy thing. I mean, the Bible says that's the whole point. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? OK, um, <coughs> maybe, maybe Isaac and, and Rebecca, maybe they, they, they warned him and he just didn't pay any attention. Maybe they didn't warn him the way they should. I mean, the one, um, remember we read earlier on about, remember, who, wasn't it Rebecca was, uh, Jacob was Rebecca's favourite. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, that's right. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and the different one. And, and Esau was, um, was Jacob's favourite. Okay? Uh, sorry, um, Isaac's favourite. Okay, so maybe it was, that, maybe it was that, that Esau didn't get the instruction from his mother about how to find a good wife that he should. I mean, if you look at, we won't turn there now, but Proverbs chapter 31, and it describes, mm. remember the Proverbs 31 woman? But it, that talks, it says, that it's the instruction of a mother. There's a mother who's instructing her son, and she warns about, about women, warns about alcohol, and then it describes the perfect woman. And notice, it's a singular as well. It talks about she, 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 she all the way through, all these attributes that she should have, you know? And, um, yeah. yeah, so... That, that's an important thing we need to understand, is that who you choose for a husband, who you choose for a wife, can make or break your life. So, we'll finish up. Just a um, question for you, sorry. <coughs> what if you don't want to get married, or you don't think God wants you to get married? Oh, <coughs> yeah, yeah being, being married is pure, is optional. Absolutely, it is optional. I mean, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul wasn't married. Mm -hmm. So it's not that someone has to get married. But to be honest, for the majority of people, the, the best thing is for them to be married. I mean, the Bible says it's not good for the man to dwell alone. Okay? And uh, often if you've, if you've seen dwellings of, of men who, who live alone, sometimes you can see why it's, 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 it's not good for them to dwell alone. It's normally can be a bit smelly, be a bit dirty, and, and so forth. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a command. It's not a command. But the fact is, for the average person, you know, most of the apostles that we read about, you know, Paul wasn't married, Barnabas wasn't married, but the other ones, they, or they all had wives. You know, we read about them, and that's what Paul said. He says, we've got the right to take about a, you know, a sister, a wife, as the other apostles and Cephas and, and so forth. Um, so it is optional, but having said that, for most people, they will, and, but you need to be careful who you choose. You know, don't just sort of go into something blindly. So once again, just all what we've seen in this chapter, we saw at the start, we saw God's blessing on those who are obedient, didn't we? It was on Abraham, it was on Isaac. You know, we saw the warning about the sins of the parents being repeated by their children. We saw the need to hold on to tradition and to be constantly going back to the old paths. You see, because it's easier to dig a well where one has already been dug than there is just to dig one. I mean, we saw Isaac digging new wells, but isn't it easy? Imagine if someone's dug a big hole in the ground, they've dug a well, they've found water, someone's then chucked some dirt in it. It would be easier to dig that again than to dig a new one, wouldn't it? Because you're not going to have the rocks and the, the ground's going to be really hard there. So it's definitely easier. Okay? And so we need to be digging. Mm -hmm. We need to be digging wells. We need to be redigging the old wells and we need to be in God's word. Okay? The world today has stopped lots of the wells. It's changed things. You know, they've moved the landmarks. But we need to say, no, we're not going to move. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back. 
to the old ways. Go back to the old paths. That's why you're in an old-fashioned church. Why? This is an old-fashioned book. This hasn't changed. Mm. And so we're not changing. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Mm. Unmovable. Always abounding the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labour, your work, is not in vain. Lord. Okay, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to come into your house, Lord. Thank you for the souls saved this week, Lord. I just pray you'd help us to reach many more. Help us to be um, always abounding in your work, Lord. <laughs> help us to be, help us to redig the wells, Lord. Help us to stand fast for the fundamentals of the faith. Help us to stand fast for, fast for the, the, the salvation by grace through faith alone. Help us to stand for your word, your pure, preserved, inspired, and errant word. Help us to believe every word of it. Help us to live every word of it. Lord, we thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.